Hey everybody, welcome back. Uh, Dylan here. This is my Knights of the Frozen Throne set review. We're going to go through every card in the set. We're going to give it a rating between one through five. And we're also going to give a few of these cards my special silver design star to indicate cards that regardless of how powerful they might be contextually are well designed and kind of provoke interesting uh, thoughts and uh, actions. So without further ado, we're going to move right into the Druid, Hunter and Mage cards. We're going to go through each of these in order of rarity and we're going to go through them alphabetically within each rarity category so if you want to hop around you know how to navigate let's do this thing first off for druid we've got crypt lord this is a three cost minion uh, it's a one six with taunt and every time you play a minion you get plus one health on crypt lord um, this card looks really good on the surface, but the problem is that it doesn't really compare with something like Tar Creeper. Tar Creeper, uh, against the decks you care about playing a card like this against, is effectively a 3-5 taunt for 3. This is a 1-6. Yes, it has the potential to become a 1-7, 1-8, whatever. But the problem is that missing those extra 2 points of attack really hurts this card. Uh, I'm going to give this card 2 stars. I don't think it really has what it takes to be able to knock Tar Creeper out of that three cost uh, taunt minion slot, even for Druid specifically. Um, it's got a little bit of potential. That's why we're giving it two, because it could potentially get really out of hand and soak a lot of damage. But I just don't think there's a lot of situations where you're going to want this over Tar Creeper or over Druid of the Swarm, which we're going to get to in a minute. Next up for Druid Commons, we've got Nash. Nash is a three cost spell. It gives you plus three attack and plus three armor. This card is miserably bad, much like Bite and Claw. It's kind of cousin cards that give you X attack, X armor for X mana. This is like a completely almost strictly worse version of the card Bash and Warrior. Bash was really good because you could go face with it. You could kill a minion with it. You get three armor and you didn't have to take face damage in exchange. This is the same thing at the same cost, except you can only hit things that you can attack. So you're foiled by taunt minions and you have to take face damage. Absolutely nonsense. This card is horrible. One star. Uh, our final druid common is Webweave. Webweave is a five cost spell that gives you two poisonous one two spiders. Um, now, up front, I'm going to say this card is a two star card. It's not really that good. It has some very fringe playability in control decks that really need the ability to grapple with multiple major threats. And this does answer a problem that Druid kind of struggles with historically, which is they don't have a lot of good options for removing single large minions, and therefore they, they tend to, to struggle against that. Uh, however, I just think this is too slow of an implementation of such an answer. Uh, it is kind of like a double assassinate for five in the best case, but it's also five mana, do nothing and lose everything you just did to concentrate in the worst case. And I think you're going to see the worst case much more often than you're going to see the best case. So, yeah, this is a two star card. I'm going to give it that that second star because I think maybe it can do something in control druid, but it's just too slow, too clumsy, too fragile, unfortunately, to really be able to fulfill its intended purpose reliably. Moving now into rares, we have Druid of the Swarm. Druid of the Swarm is a two mana, choose one creature. It can turn into a 1-5 with Taunt, or it can turn into a 1-2 with Poisonous. This card is everything that Crypt Lord and Webweave wish they were. Uh, first of all, it has got a significant advantage over Tar Creeper, which makes it competitive, is that it only costs two mana. That means you could potentially play this turn two, or even coin it out turn one, against decks like Pirate Warrior and Token Shaman that play a lot of one health minions, and you can get a lot of extra tempo, a lot of extra value. Um, also, it has the late game flexibility of being able to be played as a one two poisonous if you're in a situation where you absolutely need to remove a big minion and you don't have any other options and a one five taunt isn't really going to avail you because it has this good stat line and good utility and late game flexibility all in a two mana package. I'm actually going to give this card four stars. I think you're going to see a lot of this card. I think most druid decks can find something advantageous to do with it. I think it's very strong. And it's a great anti-aggro tool uh, for a deck that can always use more of those. Our second druid rare is Spreading Plague. This is a five mana spell that summons a one five with taunt and then summons another one each time your opponent has more minions after the spell finishes resolving. It's a little complicated, uh, but what it basically comes down to is unleash the scarabs. The problem is that it doesn't have as much of an immediate impact on the board. You can't win the game with it like you can with Unleash the Hounds. It costs five mana and it only works when they have significantly more minions than you. It only works in a valuable sense, at least. At its worst, it's obviously a one five taunt for five. That's horrible. If you get two of them, OK, you're getting a two ten for five. That's kind of cool. It's actually 
slightly ahead of the the stat curve by one if you get a whole bunch of them that's really cool too but because you're playing druid how many situations are there going to be where your opponent is beating you down with a huge number of minions and you would rather play this against something like a swipe or a starfall that can actually kill their guys um this card gets two two stars there's a small possibility that it gets used uh, in extremely greedy control druid decks but otherwise i just think it's too slow and it's too unreliable to really be worth a deck slot our last Druid Rare uh, is Strong Shell Scavenger. Uh, this is a 2-3 for 4 that gives all of your other taunt minions. Technically, it gives all of your taunt minions 2-3. So if there existed or was printed later some effect that could cause this guy to come into play with taunt, he would affect himself. But functionally, he gives all your other taunt minions plus 2, plus 2. This is kind of a cool effect. Um, it's it, Again, it's the, the Blizzard classic of take a spell, take a minion, merge them together. This is a bolster, which is two mana and a two mana, two, three that are just kind of fused into one guy. Uh, that being said, you have to hit at least two guys with this for it to be better than Yeti. If you hit exactly one guy with this, it is effectively Yeti. Um, and if you have no other guys, it's a two, three for four. Uh, this is a two star card because even though it gives you a good effect, the odds of you being able to exploit it hard enough to be worth your spell slot and reliably enough to be worth your spell slot is just very, very low. I'm not going to give it a one star because it does have the opportunity to do crazy blowouts uh, with things like Spreading Plague or, or uh, things like the Druid um, Death Knight. But I just don't really think it's good enough to be worth including in a constructed deck. Moving now into the Druid Epics, we have a very interesting one. Uh, we have Fate Spinner. Fate Spinner is a 5 mana 5-3, and you know how I feel about those. However, it has a completely unique effect uh, currently in Hearthstone, which is secretly choose one, deal three damage to all minions, or all minions get plus two, plus two as a death rattle. So it's a secretly chosen, it's a hidden information death rattle effect. I'm not sure how good this is because I feel like the effects are so divergent that it's going to be pretty easy for your opponent to to predict and kind of read what you're doing. There's the possibility of totally blowing somebody out uh, by having them misread and misunderstand what's going on. But I feel like there aren't a lot of situations where that kind of mind gaming is going to be reliable enough to warrant this card's inclusion. Uh, it's a two star card. Uh, it does have a small amount of of uh, potential niche playability. If you just read it as a five three with death rattle deal three to all, it's not a horrible card for control druid. Um, I don't think it's really going to get play in aggro druid. It's too slow. It, it's a five mana thing that comes down with that. Not a terribly competitive body. And yes, it'll give all your guys plus two plus two, but it gives all their guys plus two plus two as well. They're not going to want to kill it. Then you have to trade it out on your turn. They're going to try to make it where you can't do that. So it's not reliable enough for aggro. But for uh, an anti aggro tool, I think it actually might be OK. Uh, our second druid epic is ultimate infestation. This is a whopping 10 cost spell. But it lets you draw five cards, gain five armor, deal five damage and get a five five ghoul. Um, and five times five is twenty five, which is a big number for ten mana. And it's actually even more competitive than that because drawing cards is worth more than one mana each. This card is really, really good with the right setup. Um, I think this card actually might get played as a one of in, in Big Easy Big Druid because it just lets you basically Firelands Portal and you get a guaranteed 5-5 five five instead of having the possibility of getting some crappy, you know, silver hand knight or whatever as your five drop. And then for three mana on top of that, it draws you five cards and gets you five armor. If you can play this and survive the turn you play it, the extra cards that you get alone make this worthwhile. Um, competitive decks have played sprint in the past and that's draw four for seven. So this has so much value in one card only thing that holds it back is that crazy 10 mana um, price tag. Even in a deck with a lot of ramp, even in a deck with a lot of ability to play cards early like Innervate, 10 mana is just very expensive. It's a three star card. I think you're going to see it in Big Easy. I think you're going to see it maybe in some like ultra greedy druid decks, but it's probably just a little too expensive to be played in any kind of mid range and obviously any kind of aggressive deck. Ultimate Infestation also gets my Silver Design Star. Uh, it's a big, flashy card with an obvious, intense value to it that you kind of have to think about how to set yourself up and get that advantage 
from that card. It, it's a it's a Super Timmy card, but Super Timmy cards are are sometimes a, a good design element because there are players who enjoy that. And part of designing a good game and making good cards is to make cards that just kind of put the siren on and call out to a certain type of uh, player. And Ultimate Infestation is just such a card. Uh, it's got obvious power and obvious value without having an obvious dominance because of the mana cost, and that makes it an elegantly designed card. All right, finally, we're going to move into the Druid Legendaries. First off, we have Hadronox. This is a 3-7 without taunt for 9 mana, but it has a death rattle where it resummons all of your taunt minions that have died this game. So this is kind of like Nazoth, but for taunt guys. If this card had taunt itself, it would be an instant 5-star card. Unfortunately, I think the decks that want to get this kind of value aren't going to have the luxury of playing a 3-mana do... Uh, 9-mana 3-7 do nothing uh, and expect to live through it, frankly. Um, it's too expensive to be able to pair it up with any sort of good removal effect or any, any taunt that can keep you alive. Um, maybe there's some kind of niche trick where you, you do this naturalize and just get a whole bunch of taunt guys. But I just I feel like that's too clunky. It's too slow. And this is too unreliable. It's a crippling early game draw and it's not even that great late game. It can be hexed, polymorphed and silenced. And then it just becomes a really crappy body for nine mana. I'm going to give this two stars. Uh, I'm always I, I'm basically never going to give a, an effect like this one star because people who are better than me or metas that we don't know about yet could evolve that are extremely value oriented. And then Hadronox will shine. But in the current meta and in the meta that I foresee, I don't think this card is going to be very good at all. Uh, and last but certainly not least, we have Malfurion the Pestilent. Uh, this is the Druid Death Knight. He is a seven cost. He gives you five armor like every other Death Knight. Uh, when you play him, you can choose one, either summon two scarabs or summon two spiders. These are the same one five taunts and one two poisonous that have been kind of a theme throughout the other Druid cards. Uh, and his hero power is called Plague Lord. Uh, Plague Lord lets you either get plus three attack or gain three armor. And I think that hero power is what really makes this significant. Um, getting the free creatures, you know, that's rad. Cool. Getting the five armor, sweet, whatever. But there will be games, there will be games where you will play Wild Growth and then you will play Fandral and then you will innervate into this on turn five and then you will walk away with the game because the value of this Plague Lord hero power alone is just so immense. And it is worth noting that Fandral has been updated with this expansion so that he now affects things that aren't cards. So if you have Fandral in play and you use Plague Lord, you get three armor and plus three attack. Keep in mind how bad I said Nash was. This is contextual because this hero power is Nash on a stick when you have Fandral out. And that's basically as if Nash cost two mana and drew you a crowd every time. That's Absolutely phenomenal. Um, this card is just shy of five stars. It's going to be a four star card because I don't think you're going to see it in every druid archetype. I think you're only going to see it in mid range uh, and control archetypes. I don't think you're going to see it in aggro, um, but it is very, very good. It's right on the cusp of five stars. In fact, I'll probably look back at this and wish I'd given it five stars. Um, but this card is very, very good. You're still going to see it a lot. And it's a, one of the better death knights, in my opinion. Moving on. Hunter. Let's start with the commons. Our first common is Bear Shark. Uh, Bear Shark is a 4-3 for 3. For three. Uh, it is a beast and it has the fairy dragon effect. It, it cannot be targeted uh, by spells or hero powers. I really hope that they, they keyword that sometime soon, by the way, because that's way more words than I should have to use. I should be able to just say elusive. Putting that just on record, Team 5, that's freebie for me to you. Um, Bear Shark is all right. I think it's better than some people think it is. I think it's worse than some people think it is. Um, it's got the same weakness of Fairy Dragon and any other uh, lopsided attack oriented minion, which is, of course, that it gets traded into by minions from a lower mana cost. However, it does offer Hunter an interesting tool uh, against decks like Priest and decks like Mage who are looking to use targeted spells and effects to remove their creatures. Um, obviously, by default, it can't be targeted by either of Priest's dominant uh, removal spells, but it'll be pretty often that this gets plus one attack in some way, uh, whether it's from Animal Companion or if it's from Houndmaster or, you know, whatever. There's a lot of ways to give your stuff plus one attack uh, in Hunter, so it's not going to be infrequent that this thing's immunity to shadow or death is relevant. I'm going to give it three stars. Uh, I think that's a little generous. 
I'd probably do 2.5 if I did half stars uh, because I think it will get played a little bit in mid range hunter and in decks that kind of want those sticky minions that are a little more resistant to targeted removal. But I think if it were a three, four, it would be way better as a four, three, it gets traded into by three twos too easily. Uh, and that's a big weakness in the current meta. It also gets cleared by fiery wind axe, by rallying blade, by the new rogue weapon shadow blade that I think you're going to see a lot of. So that three health is really what drags bear shark down and keeps it from being a really excellent card. All right, next up, we've got Play Dead. Uh, Play Dead is a one mana spell. Uh, activate a friendly minion's death rattle. This is a one star card to match its mana cost. This effect wasn't good when it was on a 3-3 three, three for three, uh, when it was effectively costing you one health off of a, a normally statted minion. So using an entire spell slot, an entire deck slot, and paying one mana, that's just unheard of. This is ridiculous. It's a one star card. If they print some ridiculous hunter exclusive death rattle or very powerful neutral death rattle in the future, maybe this card could find its niche. But then it still has to compete with uh, Terror Scale Stalker, which is probably going to be able to, to outclass in almost every circumstance. And our last hunter common is Stitcher Tracker. Is it actually Stitcher Tracker? That's so fucking. And our last hunter common is Stitched Tracker. Uh, this is a three mana two two that has a battle cry of discover a minion in your deck. This card is nuts. Uh, this card might actually be the card that single handedly brings mid range hunter and maybe even control hunter back into playability because the amount of value this card gives you is mind-blowingly good this guy is just gonna pull lich kings and savannah high mains and things like that out of your deck so frequently because discovers such a powerful effect and it gives you such a high percentage chance of getting something decent out of your deck especially in a mid-range hunter that plays a lot of really good high value high efficiency minions this is a four star card you're gonna see it in, in possibly even in aggro hunter decks uh, who want to pull out the really efficient uh, low-cost minions you're gonna see it in mid-range hunter decks who want to pull out their uh, savannah high mains you're going to see it in control decks who want to pull out their high mains and their their crazy uh late game threats like the lich king uh fantastic card very efficient and a really good tool to kind of try to help hunter get back into the game uh in the knights of the frozen throne meta Moving on to our Hunter Rares, we have Corpse Widow. Corpse Widow is a six mana, four, six, uh, with an aura effect that reduces the cost of all your death rattle cards by two mana. Uh, this is a three star card. It has a lot of potential. I'm not sure that death rattle hunter as much as team five really wants it to be a thing. I don't think that death rattle hunter is a thing. Uh, but even outside of Death Rattle Hunter, it has a ton of really obvious synergy. Uh, it can go with Kindly Grandmother. It can go with Fiery Bat. Uh, it can go with Savannah High Main. It can go with Rat Pack. It can go with Infested Wolf. It can do all sorts of really good stuff. Uh, and it's not a gimmicky thing. It's something that actually has an immediate impact on the board. There will be times uh, where you'll be able to just drop Corpse Widow. And then if it survives next turn, you can do like Tundra Rhino into Rat Pack or Tundra Rhino into Infested Wolf and just trade in a bunch and get a ton of extra value. Um, I think it's got a lot of potential. Uh, three stars. OK, Exploding Bloat Bat. Uh, this is a four mana beast. It is a two one with Death Rattle deal two damage to all of your opponent's minions. This is absolute garbage is a one star card. Uh, it is a two one for four that you're playing in Hunter that doesn't have any ability to capitalize on an AoE that is only two points of damage. It doesn't have Mage's Fire Blast. It doesn't have Druid's Shapeshift. It doesn't have Rogue's Dagger Mastery. It just kind of watches that two damage goes out and really hopes that that kills stuff because otherwise they're going to trade a bunch of minions in anyway and probably have to do so inefficiently despite the two damage. Uh, this card would be way better in a different class, but in Hunter, it's garbage. One star. Uh, after Exploding Bloat Bat, we have Venom Strike Trap. This is yet another Hunter Trap, so obviously it's a Hunter Secret. Costs two mana, uh, and whenever a minion of yours is attacked, you summon a 2-3 Poisonous Cobra. So you get a free Emperor Cobra at a one mana discount. Um, this, I think, is a three mana card. Uh, Hunter Trap decks are going to get a lot of really good tools out of this. Uh, they get this card, they get um, Professor Putricide, and they get some interesting kind of like smaller and neutral cards that can potentially shore up the early game uh, uh, strength of the deck to help it capitalize on those powerful secrets that it has. Uh, and Hunter can sometimes have trouble dealing with uh, large minions if they don't have it uh alone on the board. So obviously you have deadly shot if the opponent has just a single minion and that's a really strong minion. Uh, but they don't really have a lot of good tools for handling 
uh, single strong minions reliably. And this card could potentially be that uh, as a one of in like a secret hunter deck. So yeah, three stars. Okay, moving into epics, we have Abominable Bowman. Uh, this is a 6-7 death rattle that says summon a random friendly beast who died this game. Uh, so this is a one mana more expensive boulder fist ogre who as a death rattle summons a random minion who has died this game. On paper, that sounds really good, but the problem is that a lot of times your pool for this is going to be diluted uh, by things like the little rats out of Rack Pack or the little wolves uh, out of, of uh, Infested Wolf or by Fiery Bat or by Jeweled Macaw or whatever. I think the odds of this giving you something reliably worthwhile is kind of low unless you build your whole deck around it and then you're kind of surrendering what makes Hunter good, which is the good early to mid game pressure. This is a two star card. Uh, it's got obvious value, which means I cannot give it a one star because it is intrinsically just got a ton of potential value. But I don't think that the world is currently structured in such a way that that value can be capitalized on uh, our other epic is one of the most confusing cards in the set toxic arrow uh, two mana spell deal two damage to a minion if it survives give it poisonous like I read this card and I think did someone is this a typo is this a mistake is it supposed to say something else because this doesn't make any goddamn sense uh, it's shittier than frostbolt it can't go face and you could play it on your own guy to give him poisonous, but big deal. It has to be a three health minion to survive. And if you're in a situation where you're having to trade in a three health minion, because if you think about it, it does two damage. So it's only good in a situation where you have a three health minion that you're willing to trade in against a target that has six or more health that your minion can attack that you couldn't play another card to remove. The condition list is so long and the effect is just such garbage. Uh, this is a one star card. Nobody's ever going to play this card on purpose. I've been wrong before, but if I'm wrong about anything, I don't think it's going to be this. This card is horrible. And finally, we have our Hunter Legendaries. Uh, first off, we've got Deathstalker Rexar. Uh, he is a six mana um, Hunter Death Knight. He gives you five armor like every Death Knight. His battle cry is you just deal two damage to all opposing minions. Just pop, 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 and pop them all off. Um, his hero power is build a beast. This is a kind of a complicated hero power, but effectively you activate it and then you'll get two options. You'll get the first option. The second option, uh, it'll take the mana cost of the first. It'll take the body and the effect of the second. And it'll kind of merge them uh, together. Then that card gets added to your hand. So this card is only going to be good in control hunter. It's just too slow to really be good in mid range uh, compared to playing just playing a Savannah high main on six or whatever. Um, but in Control Hunter, if that becomes a thing, that build a beast hero power is going to give you so much value over the long game and let you build these very powerful, aggressively costed beasts that can let you grind out the win uh, eventually. Um, this is a three star card because I think there's only one archetype it really has a chance of appearing in. And I don't think that archetype is actually very good, um, but it's still a really cool effect. He looks really cool. And like all the Death Knights, he's got a lot of flavor to him. So, you know, your mileage may vary. Maybe you'll love this guy. I think he's only three stars. And our other Hunter Legendary is Professor Putricide. Uh, this is a four mana five four that every time you play a secret, you put a random secret into play. This is what I was talking about when I said that Secret Hunter might maybe just get the tools that it needs to do a little bit better in this meta. Um, turn three, Cloaked Huntress. Turn four, Professor Putricide. Play a free secret, get a free secret, play a free secret, get a free secret is a really crazy meme-tastic kind of turn four play that is pretty hard to beat for your opponent. Um, you can't mind game the hunter's traps when they get them from future side because they are literally random. So you can't say, oh, nobody plays snipe. Nah, nobody plays snipe in this meta. Maybe future side plays snipe. You can't attack and be like, oh, nobody plays explosive trap. Or you can't be like, nobody plays misdirection because those can come out of future side. Uh, and that kind of chaos factor, I think you actually Actually need to not underestimate while those secrets in general might be less powerful than secrets you'd put into play on purpose uh secrets are special in that unpredictability is extremely valuable for them i'm gonna give this three stars i think it it obviously is an auto include in any secret hunter deck i just it's not good enough to go in any other deck if it were a four or five instead of a five four it would probably be four stars instead because it would have a yeti body with a potent effect but because it's a 5-4, it's traded in too easily, and that is what really drags this card down. Uh, so yeah, three stars, just like Rexar. It's going to be fun. There's going to be all sorts of crazy meme-tastic highlight videos out of this. Uh, I certainly hope I get some, but I don't think it's competitive. Okay, uh, moving into Mage cards, we have Breath of Sindragosa. 
Uh, this is a one mana spell that deals two damage to a random enemy minion and freezes that minion. So your first thought when you read this is like, oh boy, it's Flame Cannon. Flame Cannon came back, but in half of its own form. But two is a much shittier number than four. Like two is more than twice worse than four, if that makes sense uh, in Hearthstone, because a lot of things have three health. Um, freezing the minion is cool, but because you can't choose what to freeze, the value of that goes down a lot. Um, freezing uh, two three, for example, isn't really a big deal. The main problem with this spell is that it has to compete with mage spells. If they printed this card in a different class, like Shaman, for example, it would have a much better chance. But mage spells are so efficient and so powerful that you have to take out or consider taking out a Frostbolt, a Primordial Glyph, a Fireball, a Frost Nova, and none of those cards get outclassed by Breath of Sindragosa. Uh, this is a two-star two -star card. Um, it has potential uh, maybe in like Singleton Mage, but... I just think it's too unreliable and too low impact to be worth a card slot. Next up in Mage Commons, we have Cold Wraith. Uh, this is a 3-4 for 3, but it has a battle cry. If an enemy is frozen, draw a card. Um, this is actually really insane. This card uh, is really easy to exploit with other cards uh, like Ice Walker uh, and, uh, Ice, uh, and Water Elemental. Um, even Breath of Cendricosa, obviously Frostbolt, Frost Nova, Blizzard, Cone of Cold... Uh, all of which, even if you don't run in your deck, you have a chance of getting off of things like Babbling Book uh, and Shimmering Tempest and Cobblest Tome. Uh, so I think this card's actually really good. I'm going to go to four stars because a three mana three four is often good on its own. And a three mana three four draw card with no drawback is insane. Even if it's only half the time you draw a card, it's still a three mana three four at its absolute worst. So yeah, I think this is a four star card. You're going to see it in, uh, in Gunther Mage. I think you're going to see it in Secret Mage. I think you're going to see it in any kind of aggro oriented mage deck. Next up, we've got Frozen Clone. Uh, this is a, a, a really cool pun on Frozen Throne. Eh, you can't unhear it. Uh, and B, uh, kind of a cool inverted throwback to Duplicate crossbred in with mirror entity uh so this is a mage secret obviously means it costs three uh that when your opponent plays a minion you add two copies of that minion to your hand this effect on its own would only be three stars but i'm actually gonna give it four stars and let me explain a little bit my thought process behind that uh so the cool thing about frozen clone is that it exists in the same universe as mirror entity because mirror entity is a classic secret um, that means the standard play around for checking whether or not mirror entity, uh, which is you play your smallest minion. So, for example, babbling book, when you're doing the standard mage play around secret checklist, the first thing you do is you play a small bodied minion that you don't care if they get on their side of the field through mirror entity because this card exists. It exploits that existing best practice for checking for mage secrets, because now if they play Babbling Book, you get two free Babbling Books. You basically got to play an Arcane Intellect that didn't pull cards out of your deck that gave you two extra Babbling Books. It gave you two extra Blood Mage Thalnos. It gave you two extra Doomsayer. It gave you two extra Arcanologist. It gave you two of some other classes, low mana cost card like Hydrologist. It's really good and it screws with the best practice for checking for mage secrets. And that's why I like it so much. I'm also going to give it my silver design star uh, because I think the elegance with which it interfaces with the existing mechanisms of gameplay in Hearthstone is just really brilliant. I think it's one of the coolest cards they've developed and it's also really good. So I can't help but love it. Four stars, silver star, love this card. Moving into the mage rares, we've got Doomed Apprentice. Uh, this is a 3-2 for three that says your opponent's spells cost one more. So obviously this is an inversion of Sorcerer's Apprentice. Uh, even her her um, voice line when you play her uh, is an inversion. Someday you'll be just like like me uh but i just don't think it's that good it's too fragile uh three twos for three really die very very easily even to like two threes for two and the effect is an aura not a battle cry uh which means that it's just going to get traded into or pinged off or whatever relatively easily and they're just going to move on with their lives um it's probably a good thing that it's not too good because this is an annoying effect uh but it is nonetheless not very good two stars Okay, next up we've got Ghastly Conjurer. Uh, this is a 2-6 for 4 with a battle cry of add a mirror image to your hand. Um, so I'm going to level with you for a second. I really like Exodia Mage. It's one of my favorite decks. So on a personal emotional level, I am really excited about this card. This card will be very, very good in Exodia Mage because it will give you a decent body that can fight aggro 
and it will give you a spell that triggers towards open the way gate and the spell you get lets you survive against aggro, which is your natural foe, uh, the natural predator of quest mage. Um, it's only a three star card because it is good in exactly only the circumstance that I just uh, described. It is only good in quest mage. It will not get played in any other mage archetype because nobody really gives a damn about mirror image and a two six for four isn't really good enough. But specifically in Exodia Mage, I think it's actually really good uh, and it'll be pretty much an auto include in every Exodia Mage deck. I know that I will certainly be playing at least one. Uh, ghastly conjurer finally for the mage rares we have ice walker ice walker is a one three for two but he causes your hero power to freeze the target this is a really interesting effect uh it transforms your hero power into something that is utterly different normally it exists only to enable uh, favorable trades pick off small minions and kind of get s slow accumulated value with ice walker your ping now has value against the target of any size you're never going to be in a situation where with ice walker on the board your ping has no good targets this can even here even freeze heroes which is really useful uh this is only going to be a three star card because i think a one three body is just not quite good enough um and that the effect is only really good in like a hard control mage it's not really important enough to a mid-range or or secret discover kind of mage um, but it is a really cool card. It's also going to get my silver design star um, because I think it plays with the design space of hero powers in a really elegant, interesting way um, that immediately kind of evokes thoughts of like, oh, wow, well, what what else could this do? Right. Like, are we someday going to get a mage minion that says your hero power is poisonous? Uh, you know, are we going to get something someday that, that gives other people's hero powers extra weird attributes like this? Um, I don't know. And that's cool because it opens a whole new world of possible interactions in a design space that really hasn't been touched before the only time we've really seen hero powers get played with it before is just kind of numerically increasing them we've never seen like taglines get added to uh, mage's hero power like this and it's really cool i like it a lot moving into our epics we've got glacial mysteries this is an eight cost spell it says put one of each secret in your deck into the battlefield if this said put a copy of each secret in your deck into the battlefield i wouldn't hate it so much this is eight mana to draw a bunch of things out of your deck and put them directly into play even if it's not a good time to put them there and it's eight mana so you've probably drawn a lot of your secrets anyway because you're playing this in a class that has arcanologist so this is actually a one star card i just don't see what like what universe exists in which i draw this card and i play it and it does anything i give a shit about right it has to hit three secrets to be worth it mana wise if it's two secrets it's kind of like an arcane intellect with a one mana discount but you have to play both the secrets immediately. It's really troubling. It, it's got too many weaknesses. It's way too expensive. And it's dependent on you having bad luck in a weird way and not drawing your secrets already. So, yeah, that's a one star card. It's not very good. Uh, we also have Simulacrum. This is a three mana spell that says copy the lowest cost minion in your hand. Um, so, in other words, you play the Simulacrum. It becomes a copy of the lowest cost minion in your hand. Um, this is only a two star card because there doesn't exist a lot of space in which you get anything really good out of playing this that's worth three mana. Um, it's kind of three mana draw a card, but you have almost perfect control over what card you draw and it doesn't come out of your deck. But I just think that's too slow, even for control. Um, obviously, what you do with this is you play this and you get an extra Doomsayer, you play it and you get an extra Archaeologist, you play it and you get an extra Babbling Book. Um, but I just don't think it competes with things like Arcane Intellect or Arcanologist itself or even uh, Frozen Clone in terms of getting that sort of uh, cumulative value. I am going to give this one also uh, my Silver Design Star, um, which is my third one here in the Mage class. Take note of that. Mage cards got very interesting stuff this time. Um, I'm going to give it my Silver Design Star because I think it opens the possibility of extreme exploitation and cool combo gameplay that historically Hearthstone has actually been somewhat reluctant to support. Combo decks, you know, have always been kind of in the crosshairs for the balance team uh, for Hearthstone. And seeing a card like this, which is just absolutely a combo engine, be printed, it gives me hope. And I think it's a good way for them to move uh, design-wise. So yeah, two stars, silver star. Not that good, but I really like it. It's cool. Finally, we've got Frostlich Jaina. Uh, this is the mage death knight. She gives you five armor like every other death knight. She costs nine mana. Uh, her battle cry is that you summon a water elemental, just straight up good old fashioned three, six water elemental. And for the rest of the game, all of your elementals have lifesteal. Uh, the hero power becomes deal one damage to a minion. If this kills that minion, summon a water elemental. 
Um, I can only give this three stars, and here's my reasoning on that. I think it's a very powerful card that is just slightly too slow, and it answers something that it can't afford to answer at a nine mana cost. If this was an eight mana card, my 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 rating for it would probably go from a three to a five. Um, but at nine mana, you can't play this and then immediately combo into the hero power, which basically means what you're doing is you're playing this, you're getting a water elemental, and then you're paying five mana to gain five armor. If you make it past that and you start being able to exploit the lifesteal that your elementals now have, that's really strong. That's very, very valuable. But my concern is that as a nine mana card, it's just too slow. And the lifestealiness of all the elementals you get doesn't matter enough except against aggro decks. And aggro decks are the ones that are going to punish you for playing this on nine mana. So as much as I love the card, as much as I'm absolutely going to play this card, as much as I think it's a very powerful card, it's only a three star card in a meta uh, aware sense because it is a counter against something that it is too slow to effectively counter. All right, last card for this video, the other mage legendary, Sindragosa herself. This is an 8-8 for 8, who summons two 0-1 frozen champions to your side of the field. Now, each of the frozen champions has a death rattle that says, summon a random legendary minion. So, in a perfect world, this is an 8-8 for 8, that then summons two legendary minions. Unfortunately, you don't really have any good tools in Mage for forcing your opponent to trade into the Frozen Champions, so you kind of have to ping them yourself, which isn't horrid, but I think it's just a little bit too slow when compared to other kind of game-ending things. It's got kind of the same problem as Frostlet Jaina. It offers an amazing amount of value, but it's too slow, it's too clunky, and it's too vulnerable to the sort of things that it would want to handle um priest obviously has a field day with this situation because it can like silence your frozen champions or it can even steal one with potion of madness before clearing in some way and taking that legendary minion away from you uh so yeah this is a three star card even though i really like it and i think it's very thematic and cool and fun and and over the top and bombastic it's just not good enough all right so that does it for our druid hunter and mage card reviews Make sure you like, comment, subscribe on this video. Let me know what you think. If you think I'm totally fucking wrong, chew me out right down here in the comments. I can take it. That's good. Let's go. Let's talk. Um, but yeah, make sure you subscribe to the video so you can catch the rest of my review series. You can catch some of my upcoming videos about Hearthstone. I'm going to be doing a video about how to get back into Hearthstone if you've been out for a while uh, here in the Knights of the Frozen Throne expansion. I'm going to be doing lots of other videos about other stuff as well. So please give me that subscribe. Give it to me. I need it. Slather that red button all over my face, baby. Yes. Yes. Do it.